morning. I'm Gordon Cook from uh, Hood River, and I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for today. Our speaker is Judy McMillan Richter. She uh, took a trip around the world in a Model A. How many of you would want to just drop everything, spend four months traveling uh, 14,200 miles, crossing six continents, 24 countries, three oceans, seven seas, and 15 states, uh, enduring winters, summers, and springs, to travel around the world. Yes. <laughs> so we're real pleased to have with us today, Judy. Judy was one of eight people who took four Model A's. Two of the people were from Washington, uh, two from Cincinnati, Ohio, four from California, and we're real pleased to have Judy with us today to share her experiences. Judy? Thank you, Gordon. Uh, this next hour, you're going to step back in time because this trip was in 1982. It seems like yesterday. Uh, but of course, as we're in the new age of computers and cell phones, and uh, this is an old slide projector that we still push. <laughs> uh, the slides are still good, although. Um, but even though we are in an age of computers and cell phones, there's still an old man out there plowing his field with a wooden uh, plow and an ox. There are still cows and people street sleeping in the streets of India. And you still need a room bar in Australia so that if you're driving down the highway, the kangaroo doesn't get you. <laughs> so we're going to start out. We're going to go quite quickly in some spots. And in other spots, I had to turn the camera off. In other words, I was afraid that someone was going to take it. Uh, you're going to see some places in Syria that are no longer. Uh, that they were war-torn when we got there. So let's go back to 1982. I'm going to look a little different on the slides, which is really depressing. <laughs> but we're going to go. And these are, that you're looking on here is, are the four cars. Now, when I'm finished, if you want to come up to the table, you're certainly welcome. There's all kinds of information and pictures. Uh, the modifications for the gentlemen on the cars that they did, the extra spare parts that we had. Um, what else? The trip actually shown, and a couple of stickers, etc. So, and the car sitting in the table there is a uh, Jim Beam decanter full of booze. There's only stay away. There's only five in the world that Jim Beam made for the actual world trip and gave to each car. But because I am not the uh, wife of the gentleman that asked me to co-drive, uh, I got one of my very own. So, anyway, you're welcome to come up, and, and afterwards I'm going to have you ask questions. If you ask in the middle of it, you're going to totally confuse me. So. <laughs> okay, so you'll, we're going to go, uh, we're, you know, if Model A people will only go about 40, 45 miles an hour. We have no power steering. You have to double clutch, and there'll be no heat except from the engine, and no air conditioning except the side windows and a partially open windshield which only brings the hot air in and the dust. Now Henry Ford built some five million Model A's from 1927 to 1934, and an estimated half a million of them are still running today. So the feasibility of driving one around the world was really never a question. And after my dad took me to the movie Around the World in 80 Days as a kid, I really wanted to do, go around the world, and I didn't care how he did it. So when I was at a birthday party in Boeing, a young man was saying, I think we're going to go around the world in a Model A. And I said, jokingly, well, if you ever need a co-driver, just let me know. I had to put my hand up because the slide projector's there and I'm here. So if I'm holding up my hand, don't panic. Now, a group of auto, uh, Model A owners in 1962, they did a trans continental tour, and I don't know if you're aware of that, from New York to San Francisco and back again. 
and they were looking for a new challenge. And so what they decided to do was go from the, the Minneapolis Convention, Model A Convention, and go around the world east, coming back to the convention in time of the opening. So really what this is, is basically a race against time. So although the, uh, there were over a hundred people signed up originally for this trip, can you imagine a hundred Model A's going around the world together? We'd still be there. <laughs> and by the way, it would cost you $19,000 per car. So that's the beginning. Luckily, only four could afford it, and we went. Now, no trip of this magnitude has never been accomplished before, so it would only, not only be a record-breaking event, it would show the re reliability of a U.S.-built automobile. No, so I'd forgotten about that party that Kurt Peterson came to my office and asked me, are you serious? And I didn't know who he was, and I said, about what? He said about being a co-driver. Well, you know my answer. <laughs> so now come the medical exams and the passports, including those, I told you I look differently. <laughs> uh, and we we're all allowed one piece of luggage, a sleeping bag, and I took a blanket, and you know those rubber donuts that you sit on? Well, believe me, later on they'll come in really handy. Unfortunately, we couldn't find a lot of sponsors. The Ford Motor Company at that time was in financial distress. So even though his cars were going around the world, uh, he wasn't participating. So thankfully, the Regal China Company, and that's these are actually, these aren't cars, these are again, gym bean canisters, and they want us to take these and put them in the cars and have dignitaries sign them. Now, not that we don't have enough things in the car, but we're taking these to have dignitaries sign them to bring them back. But luckily, they gave us $1,500 a car, so we said, sure. This company's gonna get us out of a couple of tight spots more than once. So on March 22nd, with only two driving lessons. <laughs> Can you see me back there? With three driving to the Model 8, we're on our way to meet the other couples in uh, Minneapolis. But in Monta Montana, we encountered four inches of snow. The car was dirty but running great until evening when the water pump started to give Kurt some trouble. So across Wyoming and South Dakota, we confronted huge snowflakes and gusting winds, which kept the windows iced up and snow blowing through the cracks. Bouncing along in a Model A for long distances found that rubber donut mighty nice, and my long jog worth gold. In Minneapolis, we met our fellow travelers. The cars were checked and rechecked. We co-drivers had to take tests. Now, we, you have a husband and wife team, so we've got four women and four men. I've only had two lessons, and now they're going to give me a test to see if I can do this, but then I'm there already, so I'm going to tell me no, no. So, does anyone have to go to the bathroom before we start? Here we go. So, after crossing the Brooklyn Bridge, the car is headed to a shipper at 3.30 p.m., and he didn't want to accept them until the following week. But after much persuasion, he relented, saying that they must be ready 5 o'clock. Now, remember, it's 3.30. It's taken us almost five months to pack these cars and get everything ready, and we have five minutes to unpack them, find boxes, and get them to the TWA flight to ship them to London. Well, that's the Brooklyn Bridge. We didn't do it fast enough. <laughs> Arriving in London seven hours later, we discover our cars are not here, and the New York agent had not received prepayment and the U.S. shipper has gone bankrupt. So the cars are in the United States, and here we are in London. So drastic measures were called for, and we are advised that the international freight forwarding company, called Schenker's, handles circuses and space equipment. So certainly they should be able to handle four Model A's. But for the next 10 days, we wait. So while we're in waiting, I'm going to introduce you to the people. Diane and Bruce Davis are our travel coordinators 
from Walnut Creek, California, driving a 1931 convertible sedan. Bruce is a telephone company engineer, and Diane is going to have us go to incredible places because she's a historian. Bruce gets upset when things go wrong and raises his voice a lot, and things are going to go wrong. Uh, back one. There wasn't one there. There wasn't one there? Oh, well, we'll play it by ear. Okay. That's Kurt and I. <laughs> Let me just move into this. This is the 31 Special Delivery Woody from Seattle. And Kurt is a carpenter at Boeing. Quiet as a church mouse, unless someone talks about cars. And I'm the only one that's done any traveling. Okay, go play it. No. Where did you lose all those people? <laughs> there were like three pictures that were not there. Oh, okay. I apologize, people. So I'll just tell you about the other two. They're from Cincinnati. Um, he, he owned a um, 1930 standard coupe. And Doc is a dentist. And, Dar and their, his wife are from Downey, California, in a 31 Victor, a Victoria coupe. Uh, Darlene's going to have the hardest time. She has to get her hair done all the time, and I am going to eventually call her Harriet Hilton. Excuse me. <laughs> and the only reason she came on this trip is because he promised her a Mercedes Benz when she got home. <laughs> so I'd sign up too, eh, girl? Okay. Now, ladies, we have 10 days to explore London. And so we're going to go to the famous Harris department store which is four and a half acres and five floors of everything from exotic food to gifts. Okay, okay now we're up together. I apologize for that. This bee, bee feeder says that you guys can stand on a soapbox a box in the park on Sundays and you can talk politics or anything else you want and rant and rave as long as you don't say anything about the queen because it's very cricket to speak about the queen. So after much negotiation, our cars have arrived and we're going to waste no time. We're going to head out. And here I am sitting in Lord Montague's famous car collection. This is a royal wedding car. It's a beautiful Auburn boat tail speedster. I asked him to ship it home, but it wasn't there when they got there. I don't know. <laughs> Getting used to the cars and driving on the wrong side of the road, we passed thatch roofs, sheep grazing, mowing the lawns, and then on the white cliffs of Dover where we boarded our ferry to Belgium within two minutes of its departure. It was a close car. Our last car boarded, boarded, the hatch closed, and the ferry pulled out. And I remember Diane saying, boy, I hope the rest of the trip isn't that tumultuous. And <laughs> well, it's going to be. So after a breakfast of hard, hard roll, cold cuts, brie cheese, raisin bread, and yes, Rice Krispies, we're going to meet the obsolete car club of France. And in many countries around the world, there are Model A clubs. And they welcomed us in. They gave us special membership. They were just absolutely opened our homes to us. They wined and dined us. But I was disappointed because in Paris, this is one of the couples, that's not me. I wish it was. <laughs> but anyway, I was disappointed because the Eiffel Tower is under construction and so they had it completely surrounded. But I have to tell you about the bathroom experience in Paris and if anybody's been there, they're going to know this. You know we have these green Santa cans at the rodeos and the parks and that kind of thing that we use. Well, in Paris, they have a white, white ones out on the street. You put your prank in, you open the door, and you close it. And all of a sudden, music starts. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. And you're going, oh my gosh. So you stand on, you get on these two little pedestals, and then you try to hit the hole. All of the water is trickling down the front of this Santa can and playing Beethoven's Fifth. <laughs> Only for a prank. I mean, if, if you don't have to go to the bathroom, it's worth it. <laughs> in traveling through the countryside of Luxembourg, the German, uh, in Germany, the beer was good, but it was expensive, and so was the gas. Now, it's 
1982, remember, and it's already at three dollars and fifty cents a gallon. But I personally enjoyed the vending machines, which gave you Seven Up, grape soda, and Lauenburg blue beer. So I thought that was great. Now, over the Swiss Alps, the electric wipers could just about not handle the snow we went through, but the cars, they didn't even budge. And at the evening, we're in Austria now, our hotel owner brought us a tray and filled with Austrian schnapps and a slice of apple. And he wanted to make sure that we were welcome, so he gave us the brandy and he gave us the apple. And he says the apple's good for digestion. So you down the brandy and then you eat the apple, sort of like a tequila. And he says, he says, he laughs, he says, it's like a wife saying to her husband coming home from work, how was your day? The wife asked, very good, the host laughs. And at that moment, I think all the bells in Innsbruck began ringing because my ears were red from that white lightning. So fortunately, only 10% of our driving was done, done on the Autobahns, where we tried to keep up with, at 55 miles an hour, but were suddenly passed by a Mercedes or a Fiat going 100 to 125 kilometers, as if we were standing still. However, if they did give us a thumbs up, and with traffic conditions and road conditions, our 150 to 200 miles a day were still challenging. Even at an early stage, it would be an exaggeration that the cars are holding up much better than the occupants. And the change of petrol has not affected us as much as the cuisine. Coffee at that time was $8 a cup in Venice. Tea in a hard roll was $11. That's not my, really a breakfast with champions. <laughs> and however, we were offered a bargain in Yugoslavia. At the border, we could purchase a discount gas tickets at 10 to some percent off. Now, the key is for Diane to figure out how many gallons, four cars, are going to use to go across Yugoslavia, which we've never gone across. So while she's figuring, the little border guard comes up and he kicks the tires. Now, you have to remember that uh, vintage cars are not in the customs regulation, so they sometimes had a little trouble with us. Personally, I had never seen so many rocks in Yugoslavia, yet all the trees and vineyards stretched for miles, sheer rock cliffs stretched to the sky, bright aqua, aqua water, crystal clear rivers, and through canyons and more rocks. But this is the beauty of Yugoslavia. As we drove by a church and split, a gentleman broke from the wedding party and went wild. I must see you in Chicago on the television, he explained, because Chicago had done a TV special on it. And that evening, the young people showered the men with questions and making it difficult to accomplish the evening's car maintenance. <coughs> but in Titograd, we made a wrong turn, ending up in a red parade. <laughs> now, red flags are flying everywhere. Army personnel have guns and are walking the streets. And although we had paid guards to watch the cars through the night, the U.S. stickers had been peeled from the trunks already. Security cars was all, for the cars was always a concern. In fact, it determined our overnight lodging more than the conditions of the room or the cost. Halfway through the next day, we began to notice along the roadside some displaying of talk, gesture, and usually people smiled and waved at you. So we drove a little ways further and a motorcyclist stopped us and said the bridge is kaput. And recently, heavy rains had washed out the bridge up ahead and now we had to backtrack 118 miles over narrow, half-brick, half-dirt, rutted roads, which took a toll on the cars, not to mention ours. Now, Bruce is a, the lead car, and if we see him bounce drastically, we know to steer clear of whatever he hit. And thank goodness for my donut. But stopping to let the cars rest for a vapor lock, the Russian engineers, through an interpreter, wanted to know if our government had sponsored us. And when we said no, they could not fathom how common people could get permission from their government to do such a thing. Nor could they believe that the cars were originals, 
they must be reproductions. And when Kurt told them that Ford had set up a Model A plant in Russia during the 1930s, and there were still Russian Model A's, they said impossible and walked away. Now having to miss Peck due to border fighting with Albania, took us over the mountains and over the mountains, entering 33 tunnels, some of them a quarter mile long without inside lighting. And when you enter from the bright sunlight, you drivers know that when you come out, you can hardly see. I almost hit a flock of sheep. Detour roads were treacherous, forcing both driver and co-driver to watch for wagons coming in from the fields and water buffalo crossing the roads. But nothing compared, however, to Greece. Although I remember it for the red poppies, the banana and date trees swaying in the breeze, and the Retsina wine, which was like drinking pine needles. It was Athens' children growing up with bells on their bicycles that prepared them for horns they will soon honk in horrendous traffic jams, and honking continuously whether they need it or not. It was quite a noise. Thankfully, Diane was our history buff, so we passed some spectacular sites. This is Delphi, one of these, all of the ancient Mediterranean world hastened here to consult the oracle, and the fate of nations sometimes rested upon these forecasts. But we must keep moving, cross the Aegean Sea to the Greek island of Samos, 40 miles from the coast of Turkey, a 12-hour trip. Now Samos is the birthplace of the goddess Hara, whose civilization peaked in 550 BC. And I found it unbelievable. When leaving Samos, our ferry was designated to carry one car at a time, making only two trips. So this meant there would be two days for four cars to travel. But no problem, they say. They said, and they boarded a car on each side, hanging over the edge, lashed down with very old hemp ropes. The guys absolutely held their breath, but we made it. So the weather's turning hot now as we pass fields of women bent to the earth while the men sit in the shade drinking coffee and smoking pipes in Turkish restaurants. Today we would make up a traveling day all the way to Pamukkale, where our lodgings are high above a fertile valley in an area where water has been seeping for eons over white cliffs. The water is warm and it forms large pools of calcium carbonate for bathing and just sitting. Here also, we stand on a site of a long lost culture with rock arches and walls which include square miles of crypts, and our, our rooms resemble an Alaskan Eskimo igloo. Now it's getting hot, and I do do hot very well, which is probably why I shouldn't have gone on the trip, but anyway, it was really hot, and so we were at a lunch table, and I saw a beautiful pool sitting here. It was a swimming pool. And I got up, and I took my hat off, and I jumped in the pool, clothes and all, calmly got out, sat down, put my hat on, and ordered a meal. And I felt great after that. The next morning, the bands of nomads and camels and goats shared the road with tractors on their way to the market. Fields of purple poppies and lush green terrain surprised me. But as the day progressed, the heat became intense. We traveled this turquoise toast coast, which is known as the Riviera of Turkey, for a short while. But as we rounded a bend, suddenly the steering began to feel loose in my hands. And it was a flat tire. An old man is watching Kurt and I while they quickly changed on the road, and it's been so windy that the cars in front of us don't even know that we've stopped. And when we get there, they're having a running board lunch, and they haven't even missed us, I think. <laughs> but this is one of only two flat tires, I think, so far, which is good. Okay, sleep came at 13-hour driving day, and morning, morning found us in Adana, awaiting with street sweepers and shopkeepers beginning their day. Cars with produce from market vied for space with carts pulled by horses. And those who could not afford a car or, and, or an animal pushed their cars by hand. Wagons with people 
going to fields, horses straining with loads of oil or tomatoes, made music on the cobblestones. The smell of the bakery mixed with the diesel fuel of the buses, city smells, city smells, and the day begins. As we enter the four miles of no man's land between Turkey and Syria, there's going to be rolls of barbed wire and armed guards watching from towers, hundreds of abandoned cars line the road, impounded by a customs official, some found with contraband drugs, and all had been stripped and put along the road as a warning. This is where I hid my camera, because I was afraid they'd steal it. And we are now coming into a beautiful uh, sign that says, Welcome to Syria. I want you to know the time on the clock is 1.30 p.m. And we're about to go through a marathon of customs. And this is just going to give you a really quick example. There's no electricity in the immigration. It's intense heat and smell. Their cars are then allowed to drive 100, miles from the, uh, 100 yards from the inspection area. And a half uniform official comes and takes our passports and we don't know if we're going to see them again. Then another went through the luggage looking through the books, checking the, even the grease gun. And then after closing everything, another guy came with another revolver and he went through the whole thing. Now two hours later, we're told we needed stamps for our important documents. And to get these stamps, we needed Syrian money. But the bank is closed, so now we need to pay to open the bank. And then we have to cash at least 500 American travelers' checks or they won't do that. And the bank is just a rubble of a hole in the wall. And then the American automobile ownership and insurance papers weren't valid there, so we need to buy Syrian insurance. And now we're assigned an expediter. <laughs> and that's a civilian who's going to make it quicker for you. We don't know how much he costs. And he would guarantee we would finally get through customs. But how for the next three hours, folks, we follow him from desk to desk. And it's been five and a half hours, and the sun is beginning to set, and we're allowed to proceed to the gate with a down barrier. Now there's a guy under a big truck on a cot, sleeping, and he comes out, and he says, you need a trip pass. They didn't give us one. So we turn the cars around and go back and get our trip pass. So, hallelujah, we're now on our trip. We have our trip pass in hand, and I'm sitting there peeling an apple with my Swiss Army knife, and one of the guards comes around, and he takes it out of my hand, and he puts it to my throat. And I am so mad because five and a half hours is a long time and I just glared at him and he laughed and threw it back and said, go on. So in most countries we pay, in Arab countries we pay up to 50 to 100 dollars in U.S. bribes and paperwork. And by the way, an expediter is usually extra 50 dollars. So we're now advised not to drive in Syria. And it's now 8 o'clock. And the four cars are slowly making their way down the narrow road to Aleppo. Not 15 kilometers from the border, the lead car suddenly stops. And we almost do a domino effect on each other because we're driving so close. And the men race to the front, and Bruce has no control. He has a broken axle. Out in the desert, in a hostile land. So each car drives off the road. We push the lead car in between them, and all the lights are shut off. Thankfully, we have, there's an extra rear axle in the spare parts, and the two, two spare tires from the other cars are used under the running boards in case it slips off, and the men go to work at 9 p.m. by light and flashlight. Diane and I sit on a dark, in the dark in a blanket and keep watch, and as soon as the headlights come, all the lights are turned off, and everybody just goes silent. We're vulnerable, and we know it. Twice, they almost lose the car because we are in a slight bank, working on a plastic sheet to keep the parts relatively clean in the sand. It took to 3 a.m. to complete the job, and we let the guy sleep to 7, and we call this pot Rock City. So, relieved to be heading out, but hungry, we stop in the first city, but there are no restaurants. Aleppo has been artillery shelled the week before and was total devastation. And believe me, now it's even worse. 
We bought fruit for lunch and drank our reserve of radiator water. What we saw that day in Aleppo is now totally. And you know, you see it on the news. Early afternoon found us in the only oldest city in the world, Damascus, with what we had saved on no hotel, breakfast, lunch, or dinner the day before we splurged with the Damascus Sheraton. The cars were cleaned and we were too. But next morning, before reaching the Syrian border, we passed more bomb cities. Soldiers with, gu uh, with guns would appear out of nowhere. They'd stop and they'd check us. And although it didn't cost us as much to leave, it did it, to leave as it didn't as much as it needed to enter. Excuse me. I have to take some more. Thank you. So it seemed to take forever to get to Amman, and we drove 12 hours with the two windows down, the front wheel windshield slightly open, as our only air circulation in oven temperatures and sand grinning in my teeth. Now our plan is to go from Israel to Egypt by traveling under the Suez Canal in the underwater tunnel, which is now known as King Hussein's Bridge. We won't learn that only one car a week is allowed to cross, a diplomatic courier who must change his Jordanian license plate to Israeli and reserve, uh, reverse it on his way home, so there will be no visiting Jerusalem. We must go to the southern tip of Jordan, on the Gulf of Aqaba. From there, catch a ship ferry to the Suez City of the, on the Red Sea and to the canal. And on the way, we return to the ruins of Petra, the rose city half as old as time. We are now in our 15th country, and as we travel on barren Dis Desert Highway of Jordan, trucks are the only vehicles that we encounter. In this dry, hostile country, seashell fossils appear along the road, and in the middle of nowhere, two men with a pint of paint, yellow, and two brushes are painting the yellow line down the highway. That evening, our room of government rest house was $8 U.S., the restroom and the shower are, are outside and down a few flights of stairs where there's no cold water, only hot, and it's all, there's even sulfur steaming in the toilet. So long days driving means trying to get some exercise in the evening. So rather than renting horses, we walk through the canyon down to Petra, the Greek word for rock, and the tall, narrow passageway in places so narrow only two camels can pass at one time, making it excellent protection for invaders. Winter floods were their only enemy. And down, down to the rock cliffs, and then suddenly through the small cliff, that magnificent treasury stands before us. It's not carved from rock, but into it. It stands 125 feet, and although Mother Nature and time are eroding it away, it still takes your breath away. Now the Nebataeans built the city in 300 BC, and the Roman legions tried in vain to penetrate into the protected city, but only could do it by cutting off their water supply. There are dwellings, temples, tombs, and what must have been palaces all hewn into the rocks in colors of roses and reds and pinks and violets and blue, terracotta. The city was lost for over 700 years until in 1812 when he was discovered by a Swiss traveler who resembled an Arab and was granted permission to enter the area. Suddenly a young girl appeared before me and she was begging for something and all I had was a safety pin in my pocket, which I pinned to her tattered dress and she smiled delightedly and left as soon as she'd come. What a sharp contrast from the days when the Queen of Sheba stayed here and Cleopatra possessed the area for a short time. I wondered what kind of beds they slept in because ours were straw and rope mattresses. The next day, the highway ends at Ottawa. Camels roam the beaches there were date homes to sit under and even their version of a small pizza. But I just had to ride a camel. And it was like riding in a horse in slow motion. The tricky part is staying on when you get up and then staying on when you get down. Over 200 Egyptians, oh, there I am. 
Our 2,000 Egyptians had been waiting three days to board the ship going to Suez City the next day. And although waiting in an area about the size of a small shopping center parking lot, their passports expire every 11 months, so they return to Egypt. And they have everything on their back. They buy stoves and radios and they big small refrigerators and fans. And thankfully I could get a few photos because they would have taken my car and cook up the camera to go with as well. Our cars are four of only seven vehicles boarding the ship as everyone else was on foot, throwing their luggage and appliance in a huge pile in the forward car. Now we have reservations for uh, second class. It's flooded, which is not really reassuring, and we are put up to first class. And first class is a small cabin which two couples have to share, and we are uh, protected by an on guard the whole time. So I apologize for having reading this, but usually I'm sitting behind there in a projector and I have yet to memorize it. So, so when our ship is set in the Suez City, we are immediately signed to our expediter. And we drove to the car to the building and we had $70 of US to pay for each car, plus $50 on rugs and stamps. And now it's taking us $3 to put this on. Now we can't do it. He has to put it on. We rent it for $10, and it's going to cost us $2 to pay to slice and play off. They're wired onto the bumper, and, and we have to keep them on until we leave. So we're now crossing the barren 60 miles to Cairo, and the only site is army posts. There's lots of barbed wire, tanks, and checkpoints. And closer to Cairo, we observe military installation, anti-aircraft guns, tanks, and airplanes. Highway signs warn, warn us not to leave the highway. At sunset, Cairo was a maze of people and herds of animals crossing the street. The cars swerved huge chuck holes while coming at you from every direction. And trying not to get lost or separated from each other, Diane's trying to read the map by flashlight. When right alongside us comes this gentleman in a car and says, and we just had to follow him. And luckily, he took us right to our hotel across the river. Now, in our room, the signs are going to tell us that the power frequently goes out and the candles are provided. And another sign on the balcony warns us not to open the door because there's mosquitoes. But we wake up in the next morning to a hot, noisy city. It had been beautiful at night, and over the noise, the morning call of prayer brought past our loudspeakers and turrets reaching to the sky. Oh, pinch me, the pyramids are out right outside the window, and I'm standing below this incredible structure, a dream come true. But by day, the sphinx is, is quite impressive, but by night, from the sunset, so red, and the light music, it was just amazing, and I can still get goosebumps when I look at this picture. Now we're going to have to wait for four days to get our cars because there's no shipping going east to India from Egypt, and we could ship the cars back to Greece, find shipping there, and drive back to the route to England, and then go back home early. If we wait three weeks, we could drive India, but not cross the finish line in Minneapolis on time. But there's another option. We can fly the cars from India directly to Singapore and then catch a ship to Australia. This is the biggest decision that we would have to make. Kurt and I were in no hurry, so we voted to drive. But in the final hours, it was decided by a majority vote to go to Singapore. And Pakistani Air agreed to take the four cars to Bombay at a cost of $21,000. Now, there are over 10,000 inhabitants in Cairo, too many people and too many cars. We have sidewalks that are piled with laundry and heated coals and shoes are made on the shoemaker right on the street and the wheat is sold by them. But everything is fresh and it's beautiful and at the same time, I know the way. So we have some time to visit and so we decided to go to the oldest uh, pyramid that exists in the world. It was built 
2,615. Now the sun is merciless against the white sand, and a very old heat steps go down inside. And although the taxi cab driver told us not to tip the guy, uh, because they were paid by the government, when we got down below, he handed out his hand, and Diane refused to pay. And it's three dollars. And he says, you don't pay me, and we turn the light off, you can find your way out. <laughs> Guess what? She paid. <laughs> so after being laid down for prayer at the Mosque of Muhammad Ali, a Baroque masterpiece done in Turkish-style architect, and we're given booties to cover our shoes before entering, but we women are escorted out before the service. That evening, our hotel manager asked us to, to visit the grand opening of the Yasa Long Night Club, where Egypt's famous belly dancer, Hindi Abdu, formed before. She's extremely large, woman, shimmering, and shook, and danced, and it was 1,500 pounds for 45 minutes of graceful movement. That's what she made. When I figured that out, it's probably about $300 for 45 minutes. She was amazing. The next morning, it was back to business. Are you going back there? And Donnie and Diane were not going to get the 21,000, and they have to go to the bank and get it. And it took them over uh, three hours for them to get it. And they didn't get they gave it in ten pound um, notes. So now their purses are bulging. The purses are bulging. The envelope they gave at the bank is bulging. And they have to get back to the hotel. And there's two women in the taxi. And so when they get back, they decide they're going to put it in the safe in the hotel, right? And we go to the bank. So it took another three days to clear the airport customs while the men supervised the tying down of the cars. And uh, when we hit the Cairo airport, it is so hot and so humid and there's so many people. And we get on the plane and the guys look down and they see that the, the cars are still on the pallets. They haven't gotten on the plane. So now we are without the cars and the plane. So as we approach Bombay in the dark with the lights called the Queen's Necklace, it's beautiful. Our taxi cab driver's been waiting 24 hours in line to get one fare. This is a wedding car, by the way, and the heat strings like no flowers all over that car for the ladies and the afternoon. The Bombay shops are arranged in the type of merchandise sold. Brass and metal wares are on the street, and the tailor shops on another. And this, this little story is really quick for you women. You men are going to appreciate it. But they have some little people that are called Galawakis. And they are men that come to the house and pick up your lunch. Your men, your men, your men. And you cook it in all different kinds of containers. You have chickpeas and set of rice. He picks it up in the morning and he goes it either on a, on a train or on a bicycle or he takes it by hand and takes it to the park in the middle of the city and they sort it out because you have a little mark on your visit to tell us which it goes to. And then he gets his lunch at noon. It's sort of semi warm, but that's how he eats anyway. Uh, despite the 110 degrees of humidity to match, I explored the Crawford Market with fruits and vegetables and exotic spices. There's coconut milk or fresh squeezed sugar cane done by a hand crank recipe for limeade. This lady is selling her wares on the, on the street. They have beautiful bolts of cloth for sari. And one gentleman waved me in and said, and I went into a small back room and he fed me, I think, at least five cups of tea in order to sell me the sari. And you sit on these pillows in the instruction and think about everything that's just me. So I've come, come to the conclusion that poverty looks the same worldwide. It's just the dress that changed. And believe me, India leaves a haunting impression. 
There's one of my children that trusts her uh, hand through the good hand today that you would pack the window. There's also been the women uh, with their babies. I mean, the presentation. Mm -hmm. And everywhere, little hands are tugging on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And getting out on a three wheel cart as we get around in the grass, you are horns blaring and cars going this way and cars going that way. And you're on these three little carts. Three wheel cart. And at one point, that was a three wheel cart. Mm -hmm. I saw these children racing around in a little cart they made and I asked if I could ride them. So that was one piece of the me ride in that one. So from the hotel now, I'm watching uh, excavation of a building. Now the men did the dirt, the women put, they put it in their baskets on the head and she walks in the place and dumps it. Now in 15 minutes to the back we can do that. But they need the employment and it works just as well. Now the scaffolding on this building, however, was a little scary. It looks like matchstick sticks, helter skelter tied together with ropes. And I'm not afraid of heights, but I don't know about you, I don't think I'd be a comment. So we're waiting for the cars, and at night we get to go on a few side trips. This is the Taj Mahal. And these are actually plowing, I mean, going along. So we fly through turbulent skies to Delhi and visit the Red Fort. But the monsoons are coming. And in Delhi, the taxi can blow up cars, bikes, or space, and bicycle rickshaws taking place in many automobiles. But enough of this. The cars have arrived, and Doc, they inspect them, and Doc has a, he's the medical, he holds the medical. It's like a fishing box, okay, and we've got a red box, red cross tape box. It's got all of our supplies for medical. And he, the customs man wants to look through it. So, Doc takes out the gloves. But my biggest thrill was when the owner asked us if we could drive our cars down to the beach. And for 45 minutes, we shared the truck and oxen through villages. It was just totally amazing. We were like kids running on the, on the uh, sand. And these are uh, salt piles. And they are drying salt to sell. And I let the owner of the hotel ride in the car and I rode on, on the side. But soon the monsoons are going to hit. And so these I can't even see you. Well, anyway, you, this is what you, you experience when you're driving down the road. Nobody cares. One's going one way, one's going the other. You don't know if they're going to make it or not. And on the side of one of the trucks, it says, use dipper at night. And that means flash the light if you're going to pass. So we pass green tubes. And I'm waiting for a train here, and, and everybody waits for the train, and then it's just a mass exodus across that track. We pass a lot of lean tubes and tent, tent dwellings. This gentleman is carrying his wares. There's grandmothers carrying grandchildren, women with huge water buckets balancing on their head, wash clothes dry on the ground while sacred crowd, cows lay in the middle of the road, and unfazed in the streets by the bloody exhaustion. So our last night, Mr. Fashish, a pilot for Air Canada, India, and his wife let me drive in their 1931 deluxe roaster. And I was honored to be able to go into Rumble Street. And their car in that sunset was as red as ever. It's truly mystical about India. But it's time for the monsoon. And so it's time to head to Thailand. And Thailand is 
celebrating at this time its 200th bicentennial, and the orchid flight was what are forever spoiling for flying. Hot scented towels, real orchids, and a delicious home Thai food. But we can't say time is ticking and we must get on to Singapore. It's a clean, modern city, and yet tucked away, I found old Singapore still surviving. It's a melting pot of nationalities with a delicious water that you can even drink. There you go, naturally they have a McDonald's, but it sells more hamburgers in all the world because the sailors come off the ship and they need their hamburger fix. So it holds the record. And while, you can go ahead again. This is all canned, there's all kinds of goodies in the shops. I love this one. He's so tired, or he's hungry, but I don't know why he's sleeping. Yeah. And she's a math writer, we need to learn over there. Okay, so while we're waiting to go to Perth, Australia, I took a trip to Malaysia on the side. Nobody wanted to go with me. So I was the only one on the white person on the bus. And Malaysia is the number one producer of rubber in the world. And one rubber tree will yield up to 30 years, for three years. And it's just a lush green country with an abundance of palm, which they also make palm around. And we stopped in Kupu which is a fishing village on the southwest side of the island, built entirely on stilts over the water. And I'm sure they were entertained with me trying to, to eat my squid with my hand, which I'd never eaten before. And they all laughed. They thought that was hilarious. So now we're on our way. It's June 24th. We're on the Centaur. Most of the passengers are Australians heading home. We sail through the straits between Java and Jakarta out of the South China Sea and into the Indian Ocean. And somewhere in the middle of the night, we crossed the equator. Breakfast was old Australian pioneer dish called boil and squeak. Now boil and squeak is last night's vegetables cooked again and then seasick and hit it for the vengeance. So I was really happy when we landed our, in, our, in Fremantle and put my feet on the ground. But now we discovered that our cars are on the Musket Bay. The monsoons have hit. They forced us to dock in Colombo. And even if they arrive on Monday, we are fighting the clock again. We must leave by Wednesday or we'll miss the once a week Qantas airline flight to San Francisco. This means the cars must arrive, pass customs, be steam cleaned, and yet another catch. The agent hasn't received a bill of ladies from India yet. These past few weeks have been very stressful, more stress than driving, and everyone's on edge. And originally we had decided we were going to take 12 days to cross Australia. Now we have only six. So on July 6th, four cars are now on a race across Australia. We did purchase the rhubarb. It was the co-pilot's, I mean the co-driver's responsibility to make sure you saw a kangaroo coming. And some of our nights, the days were 600 mile drives. Now there's no restrooms along here, so it's men on the left and girls on the right. And we drive through beautiful eucalyptus trees and the bush. The sky is so blue with the sandy soil so red and although the terrain was constant, it seems to still be still changing with the light of day. And that evening, the moon was so beautiful on the bush, it's called dreamland by the aborigines. And wallabies, thankfully, stunned by our headlights in the water. Now today's trip will cover 400 miles and cross the Nullarbor Plain. Now the Nullarbor means no trees. And warning signs for kangaroos and all that were there. And we didn't see any of those either, thankfully. But the gentleman said it was a good thing that it was winter because it gets to 120 degrees and birds have been known to drop out of the sky from overheating. And when we finally quit for the day, the hotel sign said not to use the water. And we are giving drinking water 
and they're in the midst of a drought. So the shower was salt water. And then the next day we drove from 6 a.m. while the fog and the frost were still on the, in the air and we covered 450 miles driving the longest stretch of straight road in the world and so long as the Australian bite. You drive 90 miles and then you turn a little bit and then you drive another 45 and then you make a little And it was the dead of winter with the temperatures ranging from 30 to 50 degrees. We ran into freezing rain, which iced up the windshield. Now there's little traffic, so it gets really hypnotic, and I don't know how long the policeman was behind me. I knew I wasn't speeding, and he stopped and pulled us all over and said that the drums were beating for us. They knew all across Australia the Model A clubs had gotten together and said, we're coming, we're late, can we help them? And I'll tell you what, if you go to Australia, you have a friend. These are some of the children and one of the families helped us out. They gave us everything we needed. So Sydney was a wonderful site. Here we are exchanging um, publicity shots with Qantas for a half price flight on, on their airplane. We were on a 747 Comedy. They've taken on all the seats except for what we will be sitting in, and our cars are strapped in our plane, so we know they're there. <laughs> and they let us go back and sit in them and take pictures at 30,000 feet going 600 miles an hour. <laughs> Fastest the model A's ever gone. <laughs> so the flight's going to take us 18 hours. We're served dinner, breakfast, lunch, and saw two movies along with any sleep we can get. When you travel out of the United States, believe me, that flag is probably the most beautiful sight. And it's so, so efficient. We have so much efficiency here. When we got to San Francisco, they looked at the papers, no bribes, they passed us through, we went on, and we are headed to the finish line. So heading out on, on Interstate 80, crossing some wide open spaces of the western U.S., our trip roughly followed the route of the covered wagons along the Humboldt River. Wagons that could scarcely cover 20 miles a day, and we in 50-year-old automobiles are now covering 20 times that. Tired and weary, we decide we're not going to wear these clothes, we're going to throw them away the minute we get home. Diane has lost 18 pounds. Bruce has lost 23, probably from the stress alone. And out of sheer excitement, we are heading in. And this is really interesting. I'm going to give you a little secret, but they will probably tell me for telling me. But the guys kept these cars absolutely as clean as they possibly could, even going through the dirt. So when we got to San Francisco, we had to wash the cars off. They were spotless. And we got to Minneapolis and we looked at the cars and we thought, it doesn't look like we would have been anywhere. So one of the guys saw a puddle out in the middle of a car and And those we all did donuts through this. <laughs> Don't tell me I told you. And so that's why the cars were <laughs> like that. So anyway, so here we are. We have rounded the curve, and there are well-wishers, 200 of them, telling us, welcome, on and back. And this is the finish line. We've done, like, like uh, Gordon said, it's 114 days. We've been gone nine hours and four minutes. And the newspaper and the television, everybody's going to converge on us like a swarm of bees. We've driven 14,200 miles, six continents, 24 countries, and 15 states. Crossed three oceans and seven seas. Transportation for us was not only a Model A, but seven airplanes, four ferries, a cruise ship, a train, buses, taxis, and carts. In England, I, uh, India, and Australia, we drove on the left side of the road. We enjoyed temperatures ranging from 20 degrees to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. What had made this entire venture worth the inconvenience of eight people finding food, lodging, and a toilet is the farmer waiting from the field 
the old man reminiscing from a street corner and a school child squealing with delight as they passed through small villages and bounded over cobblestones which once felt by only horses. Homes had been open to us, food prepared, especially for us, and all there, though there was a language barrier, 50 years had passed unnoticed. unnoticed. We were the smiles, but the cars were the true stars. Diane ended the trip with a quote from St. Augustine, and I know she wouldn't mind if I do the same. The world is a book, and those who do not travel read only one page. I think this trip can fill many pages. Now, out of eight of us who went, there are only three still living. So I thank you for allowing me to share this evening and read a little trip of the life to me. Thank you.